Soybean Environmental Students. Today we're going to be talking about humans and their pollution. Let's get started. So when we talk about pollution and IB Environmental, here's our formal definition. We're talking about the addition of any substance, whether it's a, uh, it could just be a, like a chemical, it could be a living organism, or even energy like heat to the environment at some rate that is faster than the environment can accommodate it by dispersion, breakdown, recycling, or storage into a harmless form. So whatever we're putting in, it's harmful because the environment's not able to get rid of it. All right, it's coming in too fast. There are five major types. We're going to be learning about these different types throughout the year. Combustion of fossil fuels creates types of pollution. Uh, domestic waste, that could be your trash. Um, industrial waste is like things like you know, paint, manufacturing of different things. Agricultural systems makes insecticides and pesticides, all sorts of different types of pollutants. All right. Okay, now when we talk about pollutants, we really talk about them in a couple of different categories. This is our first comparison and really important key vocab terms. Our first term is point source pollution. Notice here in our visual, we literally could point to the place the pollutant came from with our finger. That would be a point source pollutant. It is a lot easier to regulate these because we can identify who is creating the pollutant. Um, for instance, the Chernobyl Russian nuclear waste disaster, um, the Deep Horizon BP oil spill, these are usually going to cause key vocab term acute pollution because it's a single isolated incident. Sometimes these things, unfortunately, can pollute more than one time. Um, however, we also have this category called a non-point source pollutant. There's no one particular source. Notice that these car exhaust um, pollution coming out of the vehicles, they'll affect ozone. And it's not like we can point to one particular vehicle. This is a lot harder to regulate, even though we try to do this by getting our car emissions checked. But it's really difficult to um, figure out who is creating the pollution. Another great example of non-point source is fertilizer or pesticide pollution. It's hard to figure out whose lawn or farm it's coming off of. Um, these often cause chronic pollution because it's long term since it's harder to identify, harder to regulate. Now, here are two other categories of pollution. One type is biodegradable. This part is so interesting. Biodegradable pollution in the long term will start to break down into simpler components by microorganisms over some time. These are things that we can compost. Now we don't always put these in a place where they're going to biodegrade, but if we're careful we can set it up so that they will break down. Um, this is not as harmful in the long run. It can be thought of pollu as pollution in the short term. Now, um, there's also persistent pollution. These are things like heavy metals, plastic, mercury, lead, synthetics like plastic, pesticides. These are the ones we usually hear about almost more often, and that's because we're worried about them more. They won't break down naturally. There's not a current bacteria or fungus or whatever that is breaking them down into... Um, non-harmful component parts. They stick around and not only that, they can amplify in their toxicity sometimes in the environment and that can be really scary. And we'll talk about ways to identify that, ways to take care of that whenever possible. Now when we think about major sources of pollution, um, we can think about these two types of pollutant names. There's primary pollutants. They are active immediately after they're emitted. Smoke will create particulates and carbon monoxide. That's the thing that you have a carbon monoxide thing in your house to make sure that there's not smoke. Um, and that's the thing that beeps if you didn't put batteries in it. So those are active immediately and that's why that's what we test in the home. However, secondary, think about it, number two, that's when the active 
primary pollutant will go through a physical or chemical change and it's still thought as a, a, a pollutant. So for instance, that smoke might have had sulfuric um, uh, acid uh, types of compounds in it. So when um, sulfur dioxide, which we'll learn about when we get to the atmospheric unit, comes through the smoke, that's something that comes out of a lot of smokestacks, especially those burning coal. It'll combine with water, and that'll form acid rain. That's not so great, but it's considered secondary because it went through a chemical change and it mixed with water. So it's not the first version of the pollutant. It's a second version of the pollutant. That's why we call it secondary. When we're starting to talk throughout the year about how we will manage pollutant, there's pros and cons, advantages and disadvantages to managing at different levels. So we're going to draw a um, big chart in our notes, and you don't need to write tons of this down because um, you will see this, but you will want to jot down the big ideas here. So our first category or level of managing is called the reduction level, where we're really going to try to reduce or change the human activity initially producing the pollutant. So we can alter the activity through lifestyle change by an alternate technology, um, changing our values. A lot of times this will be campaigns in the school, educating, like taking IB environmental class, community groups, um, etc., having um, incentives that are financial, um, like tax breaks, all of these things are going to hopefully not even put the pollutant into the environment. Big star for this one, this one is thought to be the best because the pollutant's not even entering into the environment in the first place. Our second one is regulating after the release. This one's not as great because the pollutant's already in the environment, but um, we can hopefully still maybe have our government agree on a way to have how much level should be in the environment um, that would be creating emission standards whether it's water or air pollution etc however this is tough depending on enforcement this is tough depending on if there's different agencies lobbying um, because they want their company to stick around and it makes that pollutant um, this could also be putting some money in to develop technologies to extract the pollution as it's being emitted, such as there's arguments that you can make clean coal by taking out that sulfur dioxide that could make acid rain, whether or not we all agree that works. Um, lastly, let's say the pollutant's already in the environment. Womp womp. Sad day. Well, we could try to restore the environment now that it's kind of has the pollution. Now, this is timely, costly, and doesn't always work. So, if we're evaluating this, this one's usually thought to be the weakest and the hardest. Um, and if everything else has failed. So, we can try to extract the pollutant think about our oil spills they've tried to have boats pick up the oil have boats pick up trash from the ocean it's totally sad but if you it's already there you gotta try to pick it up somehow this doesn't work for all types of pollutants not everything's visible um, we can try if there is a way to clean the pollutant and make things better we could try to restock um, plants and animals in the area that are really good at cleaning for instance oysters are being added to the Chesapeake Bay because they're really good at clearing out the water and making it cleaner but costly expensive and doesn't always work so when we think about these things we really have to think about how society will react which is thinking about it socially, economically, and politically. So culturally, um, some societies really think out of sight, out of mind. The solution to pollution is dilution. Um, and if they really are thinking that way, they might just dump their pollutants. Um, unfortunately, that has to do with environmental value systems, not thinking ahead, um, education, and really what the standards of living are. If if everyone's used to having lots, 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 then it's hard to adjust. Um, politically, 
it's really hard in LADCs to um, enforce a lot of pollution management. It's not their major focus. They're focused on increasing standard of living, hunger, poverty, not having civil wars. Unfortunately, in MEDCs, there's struggles with enforcement too because there's lots of business and corporate involvement, lots of places lobbying policy decisions, and a lot of government gridlock where um, bills just aren't passed as much as they were back in the 70s when the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act were made. Um, economically, um, it's really hard to put values to environmental damage um, until it's already happened. Think about Hurricane Sandy. Now we can see how expensive it is to clean up those homes that were damaged, but to make those flood protections in advance would have been hard to convince people um, because the environment's thought to be free. Taking um, clean water and polluting it, uh, it's not expensive until you have a Flint water crisis and now you're like, oh my gosh, wow, I wish I had clean water. Um, and now it's expensive. Um, and LEDCs don't have the money or the infrastructure to really deal with this stuff in the first place. So it's really, really hard. That's that for now, guys. I'm really impressed, and I will see you in class.